In this tutorial, we're going to cover quasi-static elasticity with prescribed fault slip. We'll do this in the context of the examples reverse 2D geometry, which is a vertical cross-section of a reverse fault with a splay, and solve the quasi-static and static uh, boundary elasticity equations. Steps one through four are covered in the gravitational body forces and surface loading tutorial. Here, we're going to cover steps five, six, and seven. Step five, we will put rupture on the main fault and with linear elastic materials. In step six, we will have earthquake rupture on two faults with uh, with the ruptures occurring at have with, uh, with with the ruptures occurring on different origin times. And then step seven, we will add a linear isotropic Maxwell viscoelastic rheology to the slab. The concept covered are static and quasi-static simulations for elasticity prescribed slip earthquake rupture in 2D, prescribed slip on multiple faults, and elastic and viscoelastic bulk rheologies. Here is a picture of the finite element mesh that we generated uh, as part of the uh, no fault and gravitational and surface loading tutorial. So refer to that tutorial for the mesh generation process. We're gonna just jump right in to our simulations uh, overview is the README includes the brief description of the various examples and the commands for running them. The pile of parameter files are the, the .cfg files. We generated the mesh using the generate gmesh Python script, which generated the mesh underscore try .msh file. Our spatial databases are the spatial DB files. And then we have our output directory which uh, will is where PyOlt will dump the simulation output, and it's created automatically when running the simulations. So here's our step five. We're going to put uniform co-seismic slip on the faults with two meters. Uh, positive is left lateral, so the negative sign means it's right lateral. Right lateral will give us reverse slip. So that's a, uh, an unambiguous way in 2D that we can differentiate between reverse and normal faulting. Uh, is to uh, do it in terms of right lateral and left lateral in the XY plane. With left lateral being positive, we have Dirichlet roller boundary conditions on our lateral edges and bottom of the domain. The physics, we uh, with the faults and elasticity, we have two solution fields. We have both the displacement and the Lagrange multiplier field. We're solving the divergence of the stress equals zero, so no uh, boundary forces, the Lagrange multiplier does come into play in terms of our elasticity equation, and we're specifying slip on the faults. So let's translate that physics into simulation parameters. With our two solution fields, we have to uh, change the default values. Uh, the default values we're going to use are the quadrature order and, and, and basis orders, but we do need to change the type of the solution that's being used. In this case, we're doing solution displacement Lagrange, um, and we have to specify, um, uh, well, here we specify the default values for the basis order of the, both the displacement and the Lagrange uh, multiplier. For uh, the material properties, we have, uh, this is the same as our earlier steps. We have slab, crust, and, and wedge. And we're again using uh, material, uniform material properties. So we use basis order zero, mat elastic. Um, and uh, so that's pretty much the same as what we've had before. Boundary conditions, Dirichlet time dependent boundary conditions with zero displacements in the degree of freedom perpendicular to the fault. Three boundary conditions. The negative, positive uh, x boundaries, and then the y negative boundary. Now, this is the new thing, is the is the fault. So we have, we refer to faults as interior interfaces, or for interfaces for short. Uh, in this case, we have one interface, so we'll just call it fault. Uh, it has a label value of 20. So the name, the label here corresponds to the name of the physical group in the GMesh. The label value refers to the tag. This fault has a buried edge, so we need to mark 
in uh, the buried edge and give it uh, the marker name. The name of the physical group is fault end. It has a tag and GMesh of 21, so the edge value um, is 21. And we're going to output both slip and the traction changes. Although here we only notify this, mention the slip. The earthquake ruptures, uh, we're going to do a uniform spatial database to have uniform slip. Uh, you'll notice that here we have an initiation time. This is relative to the uh, origin time of the rupture. In this case, we don't specify an origin time. We just use the default value of zero, initiation time of zero, so no local offset relative to origin time. The final slip in the left lateral direction is minus two, meaning two meters of right lateral or reverse slip based on the orientation or fault surface and no fault opening. Parameter files, we have our mesh generation, our mesh file generated from GMesh. Pilot uh, parameter file that's come to all time steps that was covered in our earlier tutorial. And so we'll focus on our uh, fault slip parameters in the step 051 fault. Um, and we're using the same elastic properties that we used before. So let's look at our parameter file. So we have our metadata at the top. We have a brief description in comments of what, type, what this looks like. Um, coming down, we have our uh, parameter uh, specification of output, step 05A. For our problem, uh, we just need to change the solution uh, container from being just having displacement to having the displacement and the Grange multiplier. That's a predefined container um, that we set up uh, in that's provided with Pilot. So we just use that. The basis order for both of those fields will default to one. Uh, again, we set the elastic properties. Here's the fault information. Again, as we showed in the slides, we have the interfaces fault, fault and fault end. Uh, their appropriate tags, D output data fields. Here we're specifying not just slip, but the traction change as well. This is a recent addition in Pilot version four. It was not available in Pilot version three. Uh, and here you can see the full specification of the uh, rupture parameters, initiation time, final slip left lateral, and final slip opening. Um, so no opening, right lateral, uh, which means reverse slip. So those are parameters. Let's uh, run our example. So I'll pull up our terminal window here. We're already in the examples reverse 2D directory. Those are the contents. We'll run step 05A. And you'll notice uh, a few changes in terms of the output. We are include uh, sort of the same initial stuff, domain initialization. Um, you'll see we're now pre-initializing the fault. Uh, and you'll, the one thing to notice about the Petsy parameters is that now instead of uh, using LU, we're going to use uh, JMG, which is a multi-grid uh, solution scheme, and we're going to use for our preconditioner at the finest level, we're going to use variable point block Jacobi. This is a recent addition in Pilot version 4.1 that gives much better, uh, faster convergence, much uh, more efficient solution. It scales in both parallel uh, as well as with problem size and is working quite well. Version um, 4.1, uh, it's, it's new and it really improves things here. We have, uh, we converge in 19 uh, iterations. So with that, let's view our output. So we'll again use our, uh, our pilot viewer to do that. So we're gonna look at the domain output, exaggeration of 3000, X component, So there you can see our slip. We have 
uh, much more deformation and uh, displacement on the hanging wall as compared to the foot wall. That's what we expect when we have a shallow angle. Uh, again, exaggerating by a factor of 3,000, you can see we're going the top block is going to the right, bottom block is going to the left, um, and we have uniform slip. Uh, so we have relatively uniform displacements along sort of the foot wall and then an abrupt end of slip uh, at the bottom edge of the fault. That's what the uh, fault displacements, oh, the displacements and the fault slip show up as. We're going to now view um, Oops. the stress field. So this is the shear stress field. With uniform slip, we have very little change in the shear stress or shear, yeah, shear stress along the fault. But then down at the down dip end, we have, uh, you can see we have, we have for various triangles, some have very high stresses, some have a little bit of negative if they're in a different orientation. So we're definitely not resolving stresses well at all at the bottom edge of the fault. And this is what we'd sort of expect when we go from uniform slip all the way through and then abruptly drop it down to zero right at the fault tip. And we had sort of a pasted way too much stuff got copied over there. Um, so that is uh, step 5A. Now in, um, so we ran step five. There's our results. There's our stresses. Um, so how do we improve on this? Well, if we'd like to resolve that stress concentration at the bottom end of the fault, we can refine the mesh like we've done in some of our previous steps. So let's just throw in a uh, uniform refinement by a factor of two uh, while keeping everything else the same. So I list step 05B. So refinement, we went from 19 iterations up to 28 with refinement. And we can visualize our results. So here you can see, we see we have a refined mesh and things look very similar, uh, but we see uh, perhaps a little bit better resolution of what's going on at the bottom of the tip. But let's look at the stresses to see if we do any better resolving that stress concentration that develops at the bottom edge there. So cut and paste. And what our visualization command is, bring him to the right. Now you can see instead of if we really zoom in, um, we have a little bit more of a resolution of what's going on down here at the at the bottom tip. Again, most of the stress concentration is just in a couple cells, but it's as you get up right away from the fault tip, there's a little bit more coherence um, to the pattern, but still not great. Um, and that's you know we're all, we have uniform stress within each cell, so we're not resolving the stress field very well. So our next step is to switch to a basis order of two, as we've done in some of our earlier examples. So there's our results. Basis order of two, quad, change, uh, increase the quadrant order to two, basis order two for both the displacement as well as the Lagrange multiplier fault. Oops. Uh, sorry, there we go. Um, and then um, for our stress and strain, we expect those to be linear, so we increase their basis order from zero to one. Our other parameters are the same. So just increasing the basis order. So let's pull our terminal back and run step five C. Basis order two, we're up to 34 iterations. So a little more work. 
and then we can pull up our visualization. So let's run pilot fizz. And it looks about the same. We have a little bit little bit difference down here at the bottom. Um, now we're back to our course resolution mesh, but with a basis order of two. So we see a little bit of difference there compared to previously. Um, let's pull up our stresses. And as we bring over our stresses, we see a little bit different story here. Now we're starting to get uh, right down here at the fault tip on the hanging wall side. We're getting, you know, stress concentration. We're resolving it across a few cells, still not very much. Um, but uh, we start to see that uh, we're starting to get a better handle on it, the extent of the stress concentration. Um, and so if we really wanted to zero on this, we'd probably redo our mesh and keep it much finer right around here, right around the tip, uh, and then increase the mesh size away from that tip rather than just away from the fault. Um, we could also look at doing some just uniform refinement in combination with the basis order. And that's a good exercise to do um, on your own is to, is to evaluate how much uh, each of those you know, what you, can you do with, by ref, just refining an existing mesh and then also adjusting the discretization size. So we ran our mesh, there's our results. And that completes step five. So that was pretty simple, just uniform slip. Now let's make things a little more complex. We'll add the splay faults in. We'll give it a uh, one meter of reverse slip, uh, negative meaning right lateral, uh, which is give us the right sense of slip for this fault orientation. Um, and we'll do different origin times. We'll do the main fault at time equals zero. We'll then put a time step in between uh, the main fault rupturing. Uh, we'll have zero slip, additional slip, uh, say like a time step of time of 20 years and at 40 years, we'll put the second fault going. So we'll separate, we'll do multiple, three time steps, main fault rupture at time step zero, then we'll do nothing in time step one, and then we'll have time step two uh, with the addition of the display fault rupturing. So there's our problem set up, translating the simulation parameters. Now we're doing time stepping. Um, so we're going to have an initial time step of 20 years. We'll start at minus 20 years. The first thing Pilot does is it goes from wherever you are, and its first solve is at the advancing the time step. So the first solve, if we start at minus 20 years, the first solve will be at uh, zero years, which is so the the start time is the minus dt, then we advance dt to get to zero, and we'll end at 40 years. So we'll go zero. 20 and then 40. Um, we'll again use the mesh refinement. In this case, keep that in uh, our parameters. Uh, the setup for the material properties and so forth is the same as step five, same for the boundary conditions. Now our, on our fault, we have slip on both the fault and the splay. So we have two faults. Uh, so we have an interfaces array with both fault and splay. Uh, labels for the fault are the same, uh, same parameters there. Uh, and so in the parameter file, we'll look at the, uh, what the display parameters are. The main addition is that now we've added an origin time explicitly of zero years, just to make it clear, um, even though it's the default value, that it has a separate origin time as compared to the display. So there's our input. Uh, step 06, two faults elastic is our parameter file. Um, that's really the only thing that's different. And so let's look at that uh, parameter file. Bring that over onto the screen. 
So our usual setting up the uh, output, there's our refine uniform. Here's our time stepping, starting at minus 20, advancing to by initial time step of 20, all the way up to 40. Again, using, we have a fault, so solution displacement Lagrange, toe properties for our slab, which we changed in, a, in step seven. Interfaces, fault, and splay. We have our fault parameters here. So fault, fault end, output, slip, and traction changes. Same rupture parameters, uh, only now we're explicitly giving the origin time. For our splay faults, it's label is splay, it's end is splay end, because it has a, a buried edge as well. And I want to point out that in order because we have uh, what we consider a T intersection of our two faults, we have our main fault and our splay that intersects part way down our main fault. We need to first create the, the main fault um, so that when the mesh gets split uh, again by the, by the fault splay, that it doesn't try and split the wrong side of the main fault. Um, so we need to split the through going or, or major faults first and then the secondary faults second. Um, so the order of the faults and in interfaces array is important. Uh, we're going to give an origin time. Here we specify 39.99 years. Um, and the reason why we didn't do 40 years is that uh, we convert um, these uh, values. We multiply by the number of seconds in a year. If you have a little bit of floating point round off, um, then that could end up to be like 40.000001 years. Um, and if we said, oh, we're, you know, our time step is exactly 40 years, it could be like epsilon less than that, and it wouldn't impose the fault slip. So what we do is we give an origin time that's, you know, just a very, very small number, much less than time step size before um, the actual time we expect uh, to the time step to be taking. Um, so this will, when when the time step algorithm gets to 40 years plus or minus some very small round off value, we will have um, slip imposed um, because uh, it imposes slip at the time step following the origin time. So initiation time zero, so zero offset relative to the origin time for the local slip. Uh, we If we were to create a spatial variable rupture, we could have uh, the initial time vary, initiation time vary in space um, relative to the origin time. That could be slight off seconds for rupture propagation, or it could be some slow slip event where we want the slip patch to slowly grow. I believe we cover that in the subduction 3D example. A final slip left lateral minus one, so we're going to do one meter of right lateral or reverse slip on our splay fault and zero opening. So let's run step 06. Oops, it's not one fault, it's two faults. So there you can see we advanced three time steps starting our non dimensional time scale of 0.2, um, converge first iteration 23. Second iteration, since we didn't add any additional fault slip, the previous solution that we had from our first time step satisfied the equation essentially exactly to round off error. So we had no change uh, in our residual. So it took zero iterations. Then we imposed the second fault slip uh, in, in for the splay fault in time step uh, index two. It again took about the same number of iterations as our first time step. So let's view that. The output. And this will be our first time to view time dependent output. The Pyleth Viz um, viewer automatically detects that we have multiple time steps and will give us a time step slider. It also says down here that you have key bindings P to decrement time and for next to increment time. So here we'll look at, um, blow this up. So there's our first same of what we had in, st in step five. We can advance time step for 20 years. 
uh, nothing happened because we didn't impose any additional slip. And then there, we at uh, 40 years, we have additional slip. Increase the exaggeration. You can see there it is at 40 years. We can go backward in time using the P key. So there's time zero, time 20, and then our initial uh, additional slip. Um, so that's uh, pretty straightforward. It's not much more complex to have two faults than one fault. Um, it's mostly in the meshing setup that you have to take that into account. It's very, quite easy with Gmesh, especially in 2D, to generate multiple faults. You just have to be careful about the fault intersections. Make sure you have a common point there. Um, and uh, in later tutorials, we'll talk about spatial variable slip as well as um, things like creep uh, using the subduction zone 2D example. So let's move back to our slides. That's step six. Uh, our next thing we want to do is there is our visualization. Now we're going to, in step seven, we're going to switch our elastic material properties for the slab with viscoelastic material properties. And instead of taking 20 year time steps, we want to resolve that post seismic deformation. So we'll take smaller time steps. And we'll give it quite a short uh, relaxation time. So now uh, we have uh, elastic properties in the crust and web wedge given by density VPVS. In the slab, we have density VPS, VP and VS, but we also have viscosity. Um, we have the same boundary conditions on our uh, boundaries as well as on the interfaces. Uh, our time step, um, we're going to take a four-year time step starting at minus four. We'll go for 100 years. We'll use, we're adjusting the non-dimensionalized time scale, which is given in terms of our relaxation time, set the non-dimensional time scale to 20. Um, so I believe this is from the viscosity. So we're taking uh, time steps about one fifth of uh, the relaxation time, which is about the, about the highest you'd want to go in terms of um, your time step. Material properties um, for the slab. Uh, the main thing is we're changing, we're keeping, we still have a sort of overall elasticity as our material, but now we're changing the bulk rheology uh, here. So isotropic linear Maxwell is the name of the material. We uh, need to change the spatial database because we need to provide viscosity in, a, in addition to density, shear wave speed, and P wave speed as uniform material properties. So we use a basis order of zero um, for all of our uh, fields. So let's see. There we go. So boundary conditions, same as step six. Fault information, same as step six. Uh, now we're input file, step 07, two faults Maxwell. And, and in addition to our mat, Elastic spatial database, we have a Mat Maxwell spatial database. Um, so let's look at that and then we will run our example. So let's find Matt Maxwell. Now we have 12 values that we're giving. We have density, VSVP, viscosity. We have to give it uh, initial values for the state variables. That's the viscous strain. And we have to do all in 2D. We have to do four components, XX, YY, ZZ, as well as XY. Um, because of the, we're using a plane strain formulation, there are can be components in the ZZ direction. We also uh, have a state variable total strain. So we also have XX, YY, ZZ, XY values um, for initial values. Um, for those, those don't have, those are strain values. They don't have any units. Our viscosity, we're giving it in Pascal seconds. One location, zero data dimension, because it's just a point. Uh, our coordinates don't matter. Um, and so this is the density, VS, VP, and we're using a viscosity of 1.5 times 10 to the 19th. Uh, Pascal, Pascal seconds and zero for our other values. 
And so that's our material properties, a little slightly more complicated. Uh, we have to give the initial state variables. Um, so we got to specify everything that goes into our uh, auxiliary field. Okay, let's run this. This is going to take a little bit longer to run. Oops, we're on step seven. Because we're doing multiple time steps. We're evolving state variables. It actually runs quite quickly. And 26 time steps. One thing to notice is that the um, number of iterations per time step varies. And this is because we're using uh, the predictive capabilities that are built into Petsy for estimating the solution at, at time step based on previous time steps. So in general, our number of iterations as we move forward decreases. Um, it gets down to about five, three. And then when we impose slip again, uh, we have to increase the number of iterations. Then with the viscoelastic deformation, it's relatively smooth. So we have very good initial guesses for what's going on. It's taking about five, six iterations. Occasionally it increases a little bit. Um, but you know we're iterating uh, very quickly convergence, um, which is great. Um, and you'll notice that the initial residuals uh, are when we, we went from uh, when we're doing good at our initial guesses, our initial uh, nonlinear residual is 10 minus 5. Once we impose additional fault slip, it bumped up by two orders of magnitude because it, um, you know, we imposed something that it wasn't able to sort of predict from the previous um, time steps. All right. So let's look at uh, the resulting deformation. Let's bring up, uh, show the warp domain. Factor of a thousand. Let's, instead of a thousand, let's do, let's do 3000. Give it a little more deformation, easy to see. Okay, so this is a time dependent. We're going to start off at zero. There's four. You can see the, even though we don't have, full, so let me go back. Oops, there we go back. So we impose uniform faults, uniform slip on the main fault at t equals zero. The next rupture on the splay fault will be 40 seconds. So this time dependent deformation that we're seeing is a visco relaxation. Whoops. And so there it is at 36, imposed more on the splay fault. We don't get much more deformation. Um, it, it continues to, so the relaxation to continue, but with most of the deformation occurring with the splay fault rupture up here in the elastic portion, there's only a little bit of stress increase down here, um, but then it slowly continues. And you can see the viscoelastic relaxation occurring down here on the uh, footwall side of the fault. So significantly different than our elastic, where we just had nothing going on in between the two ruptures. Now we have the viscoelastic relaxation occurring over here in the fault slab. So let's bring our slides back. There's a viscoelastic relaxation. And so um, that concludes this simulation, this set of tutorials. We did not include discuss the power law. Um, it looks similar to um, sort of the viscoelastic, although we give it a relatively high um, viscosity compared to the Maxwell model. So there's not as much deformation. Um, it uses nonlinear, the nonlinear solver to resolve the power law um, update. And so uh, it takes a few more iterations. Uh, but it's quite similar in terms of problem setup. All we're doing is changing the rheology and using those parameters um, that are different than the Maxwell model.